want to take just a moment at this point to uh, talk a little bit about the balance in Congress, which was such a big part of FDR and his ability to to implement the plans of the New Deal. Um, if we look at Hoover, of course, his reputation is of such a terrible presidency. But if we look at the last um, two years of his term, Hoover, of course, was a Republican. His party had a majority of one in the Senate, 48 to 47. And the Democrats held the majority in the House, 220 to 214. If we consider recent history as an example of this, how easy is it for a president to get things done when Congress is split or even in the hands of the other party? Up until very recent history, uh, under President Obama, Obama is a Democrat, and uh, up until this past year, Congress was split along almost exactly the lines that you see on this screen, just with the parties reversed. So uh, the president is a Democrat. The Democrats had a majority of one in the Senate, and the Republicans had a slight majority in the House. Now that has shifted, and the Republicans hold both houses of Congress. But any of you who've paid attention to politics in this country over the last four or five years understand that it's very difficult for either party to get anything done when you have that kind of split. Now, if we look at FDR following his election in 1932, it was not only FDR that won election in that year. It was many, many Democratic senators and uh, members of the House as well. And so you see the Democrats um, came in at the start of FDR's term with a majority in the Senate of 60 to 35 and in the House of 310 to 117. Already they're very close to a two-thirds majority. Uh, that is the Congress of the first New Deal. And so it was very easy for FDR and his team to draw up uh, all manner of plans and programs and whatever they proposed went through both houses of Congress very easily. Uh, and then after the midterm elections at the end of 1934, uh, what we see is the majorities in both houses of Congress getting even wider. Uh, so the Congress elected at the end of 1934, which served from 35 to 37, uh, had a 69 to 25 advantage in the Senate and 319 to 103 in the House. This is the Congress essentially of the second New Deal. They are elected after the first New Deal, and the country seems to be saying we want even more of the same. And finally, after FDR's sweeping re-election in 1936, which we will talk about shortly, uh, we see the majorities growing even wider, if, if that even seems possible. 76 to 16 in the Senate, 331 to 89 in the House. With balances like that, the Republicans uh, completely outnumbered, uh, very little ability to uh, try to prevent any kind of action that the Democrats wanted to implement. So this is a really important part of FDR's um, presidency and especially the passage of the New Deal because he has these huge majorities in both houses of Congress. Now, just as a final note, let me look back uh, the numbers after the election of 1934. Um, this is the Congress of the second New Deal. And so... We've talked about the first New Deal. We're about to talk about the second New Deal. And FDR, again, has huge majorities in both houses of Congress, uh, which are going to implement uh, almost any plan that FDR proposes. So following the midterm elections of 1934, uh, the heavily Democratic Congress is called back into session in 1935, and they will begin to implement a series of acts that we know as the Second New Deal. So why do we have a Second New Deal? What are the conditions that uh, lead to uh, more uh, 
uh, of this New Deal activity. Well, one of them, uh, we've just been talking about the popular support for FDR and for the acts of the first New Deal. Uh, the elections in 1934 just seem to confirm that the country wants more of this kind of action. And so that's certainly one factor. Another factor I've just talked about in uh, the recent slides, the voices of protest coming from the left, the proposals of Upton Sinclair and Huey Long and Francis Townsend and people like that. FDR is seeing how popular they are, how their ideas seem to be taking off. And so he is going to appeal to that. He's going to be pulling his own policies a little bit further to the left and actually borrowing many of the ideas uh, that these other people are proposing. Some of the Second New Deal relates to uh, the programs of the First New Deal, agencies that are already in place or some of those programs that were overturned by the Supreme Court that I've talked about. Um, other programs like the TVA, which were very successful, now we're going to kind of expand on that idea and spread some of those sorts of programs around other parts of the country. Another thought is that some of the programs of the Second New Deal result from frustration with the courts. Uh, FDR is very frustrated with the Supreme Court overturning his programs, and there's a sense of I'm just going to keep giving you more and more and more, and you're going to have to overturn them, and I'm going to keep giving you more after that. So we'll see how the court responds to this, but at least in part, uh, FDR is just throwing more and more uh, of these programs uh, that the courts are going to have to wrestle with. And a final idea is that the Second New Deal... Um, comes in an age when more and more economists and politicians and members of the government are becoming comfortable with the thought of deficit spending. Uh, we talked about Herbert Hoover. He insisted on a balanced budget. Uh, actually, FDR supported a balanced budget. The entire First New Deal was done on a balanced budget. But by the mid-1930s, um, more and more economists are becoming comfortable with the idea that it's okay for the federal government to uh, dip into debt, um, to keep spending, to sort of keep the economy going. Uh, the phrase of, of that time was that this kind of spending would prime the pump of the economy, keep the economy going uh, in this time of need. So with all of these different factors in place uh, and with the new Congress coming in, FDR is well positioned for another round of sweeping legislation. With all of these conditions in place, we see FDR and his administration passing the acts that come to be known as the Second New Deal. We can divide the Second New Deal into two broad categories of the different sorts of acts. Uh, the first category are those acts that we might simply describe as more of the First New Deal. Uh, that is, they continue the efforts of relief and recovery, uh, restoring the economy, putting people to work, helping those who are in need. Uh, the second category, which is really where I want to, to concentrate this discussion, begins to move uh, government action in a new direction. And we can describe those acts as more geared towards lasting social reform. In other words, if we ask a question like, is this act designed to feed the hungry? Is this act designed to put people to work? Uh, you're not going to find the answer um, to those kinds of questions. They are geared towards other sorts of things. So we're going to get to those acts beginning on the next slide. But for now, I want to mention uh, a couple of the acts that are uh, more like the acts of the first New Deal um, just continued. So there are acts in the second New Deal that are more uh, relief and recovery. One of the major ones is known as the e Emergency Relief Appropriations Act of 1935. This act was a $5 billion spending measure that, uh, much like the first New Deal, carried on uh, any number of government programs designed to put people to work, 
and to help those who are in need. Um, in some cases, it continued to fund acts of the first New Deal that were already in place, and in some cases, it created programs that might have been uh, overturned by the uh, Supreme Court. Part of this Spending Act or Appropriations Act was the creation of the Works Progress Administration. Um, like those acts of the First New Deal, creating any number of programs, um, putting unemployed people to work. It was directed by Harry Hopkins. We've mentioned him once or twice already. Uh, he lived in the White House with the Roosevelts and was one of the very closest and core members of the New Deal. Uh, this program uh, spent about $1.5 billion on a variety of projects. Uh, among the most celebrated of the programs within the Works Progress Administration were things like the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Writers Project, the Federal Arts Project, uh, there's a photography project as well, um, putting all of these kinds of people to work. It was perhaps a little harder for artists who were out of work to find uh, any way to get paid, or actors uh, in the theater, or photographers. And now the government is employing thousands of these kinds of people. One of the memorable uh, and lingering elements of that program are the many murals uh, on public buildings all around the country and roadsides all around the country. You see one of those murals uh, at the bottom. And another uh, are the many photographs, and we've already looked at one of the famous photographs called Migrant Mother uh, when we talked about the Dust Bowl, the famous image of that um, mother out there in the countryside. There are many, many other photographs. So we have a, a great and lasting historical record of what the Great Depression uh, and what the New Deal looked like. The remaining acts of the Second New Deal that I want to uh, talk to you about are much more geared in the direction of lasting social reform. And the first one I want to mention is the Wagner Act, also known as the National Labor Relations Act. It's sometimes uh, referred to as Labor's Magna Carta. Uh, that is just a, a foundational landmark uh, act of legislation for labor. Uh, the Wagner Act is passed uh, about the same time that the NRA was ruled unconstitutional. Uh, and so some of the elements of the Wagner Act are... Uh, may sound familiar. We've already talked about some of these things with the NRA, but they've been ruled unconstitutional and now they need to be replaced. The author of this act was a New York um, politician who had joined uh, FDR in Washington as part of the New Deal, whose name was Robert Wagner. Wagner was actually at the scene of the Triangle Shirtwaist fire, uh, and he was part of the um, New York State Factory Commission and the reform within New York that followed the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. From that point up until now, uh, it was Wagner's dream to have some sort of federal program um, protecting workers, much like his programs in New York. And so this was the fulfillment of uh, a lifetime um, dream. Among the things that the Wagner Act did was guaranteed workers the right to form unions um, and join unions. Uh, it also guaranteed that strikes were legal um, for workers to participate in strikes. There were a lot of other elements of the Wagner Act that are kind of obscure and, and might not be familiar to you. Just as one example of that, um, the Wagner Act outlawed what were known as yellow dog contracts. Again, you, you probably don't know what a yellow dog contract is, partly because they're outlawed now. But in that day, it was a very common thing for companies to have workers when they signed their contract. You know, who reads all the fine print in your contract? Well, somewhere in that contract would be a, a clause or a phrase uh, in which the worker signed away his right to join a union. So, all right, it's 
you know, guarantee that workers can form unions, but if companies are allowed to force you to sign a contract where you sign that right away, it doesn't do any good. So yellow dog contracts are done away with, and, and a number of other loopholes that existed at that time were, uh, were banned as well. The Wagner Act is a huge and important act for labor. Uh, I would just point out that uh, it does not benefit everyone. Uh, agricultural workers, for instance, are excluded. Uh, most workers who didn't work under some sort of contract were excluded, but uh, agricultural workers in particular, so we're still talking about almost half the country that, uh, that doesn't benefit from this. But it's much, much harder to regulate agricultural workers uh, who work irregular hours, they work seasonally, uh, and oftentimes they, uh, they don't work under contract. So with exceptions like that, the Wagner Act is a, a tremendously important act for um, securing the, the rights and benefits of workers. The most important act of the Second New Deal, and almost every historian would agree the most important act of the New Deal uh, period, was the Social Security Act. Um, there are a number of historians who have um, published books recently um, describing Social Security as the most important legacy of the New Deal uh, period. So this is uh, obviously a very, very important act. Um, and it stands as a, a radical departure from the policies that had come before it. Uh, and I'll be talking about that, describing it here shortly. The Social Security Act was written largely by uh, the Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins. Uh, Francis Perkins is perhaps the answer to a trivia question. She is the first woman uh, cabinet-level official in our nation's history. But she was not simply a, a token appointment. Frances Perkins was a very important uh, official, and perhaps most important is the author of the Social Security Act uh, in cooperation with FDR. And so they met uh, several times to discuss what this act should look like. And FDR at one point in his discussions with Francis Perkins um, uttered these famous words. There is no reason why everybody in the United States should not be covered. I don't see why not. Cradle to the grave. From the cradle to the grave, they ought to be in a social insurance system. So again, this is a, a radical departure from the policies we've talked about even just a handful of years before. Think about Herbert Hoover, who didn't believe it was the responsibility of the federal government to provide aid or protection to, uh, to any Americans. And now, just a handful of years later, FDR is saying that not only is it the, the role of the federal government to provide aid, but the government should protect people from the cradle to the grave. Um, this is also encouraged and, and perhaps inspired in some ways by Huey Long and uh, Francis Townsend and others who were calling for welfare for the elderly. So let me just give you a few other points about uh, Social Security. How was it going to be paid for? Well, it, it, those of you who, uh, who have been working or do get a paycheck, you notice even now that there's always a, a portion of your paycheck taken out for Social Security. Um, the initial wave, we need to think about those millions of elderly um, who were going to benefit under this act who had not been paying into it over their lifetimes. Uh, so there was going to be an initial tax uh, to cover this, and the government was going to take something of a hit to, um, to cover that tax and to pay for those initial um, beneficiaries. Now, we understand that Social Security today consists primarily of those old age pensions, and that's what we think of. You see the, the gentleman there on the right. Social Security Act, as amended, offers greater old age insurance protection to people now nearing retirement age. Um, that's how we think of Social Security today. But in the initial act, it was more this idea of cradle to the grave protection. Uh, it provided unemployment compensation for those workers who might have uh, lost their jobs. It also offered aid to dependent children. This is the program we think of today simply as welfare, um, but cradle to the grave. So there are benefits um, to children who are in need. 
Now, like the Wagner Act, the Social Security Act does have its limitations and perhaps its flaws. Um, it also applies primarily to those who are um, under contract, who are getting paychecks. So uh, agricultural workers in some cases not covered, domestic workers not covered. Um, people like waiters and waitresses who work primarily for tips, uh, they may be covered and they may get some benefit from this program, but they're generally not putting in as much into it uh, as, uh, as much as others. Um, and, of course, there is the, the problem of how this program is funded. Uh, it never really caught up after that initial wave of the elderly who had to be covered but had not been paying in. Um, right from the beginning, the program fell behind. And so we might ask the question, and, and any of you would know the answer to this today, when you pay your money into the Social Security Act, uh, when they take that money out of your paycheck, where is it going? Well, it's going now to the people who are drawing their benefits. It should be going to you. It should be going to a savings uh, area where it will be there waiting for you. But this is the great crisis that uh, gets so much attention these days. Uh, will Social Security survive because uh, the, the money that's going into it right now is immediately being paid out on the other end? So Social Security is not a perfect program. It's flawed. But it radically changes the way we think in this country about the government and welfare. And according to many historians, it is the most important legacy of the New Deal. The last of the New Deal acts that I want to mention is the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is passed in June of 1938. We can also ask the same kind of question. Is this relief and recovery? No, this is lasting social reform. Uh, it's going to address a number of the issues that were still uh, left unaddressed after the Wagner Act. Uh, it is this act that outlawed child labor. You see the, uh, the young children there working on the looms on the right. This is a picture probably from the Progressive Era. But this kind of activity finally will be outlawed under the Fair Labor Standards Act. It also installed a minimum wage. And at that time, the wage was 25 cents an hour. Of course, it's gone up considerably uh, since then. It also established a standard work week, which at that time was 48 hours uh, in the week. And if you worked more than that, you needed to be paid overtime. And, of course, that has also changed over the years, and now we have a standard 40-hour um, work week. So this is the last of the acts of the New Deal, but you do see that change during the second New Deal. The important change to keep in mind is that these acts are more geared towards lasting social change rather than relief and recovery, putting people to work, um, and taking care of the needy. It's more directed towards lasting social change. And indeed, many of those changes remain with us today. This is simply a chart from your textbook that I draw your attention to, and you can certainly uh, refer to it as you are reading and studying and even listening to these lectures. just gives you a little road map and a timeline to the major acts, uh, many of which I've discussed uh, in my lectures to you. 1933, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, National Industrial Recovery Act, Agricultural Adjustment Act, Civilian Conservation Corps, the PWA, the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, and the Tennessee Valley Authority. Those are primarily, um, that's the core of the first New Deal. And then 1935, the Social Security Act, the Wagner Act, the WPA, and then finally 1938, the Fair Labor Standards Act.